Time to talk NFL Draft 2022 once again as we talk Cincinnati Bengals football with John Sheeran. That's right. John Sheeran's back, the deputy manager at CincyJungle.com. And, John, it was good talking to you before the draft, and now it's time to recap the draft. So, uh, all in all, how, how did the fans react to the, the first draft after a Super Bowl runner-up appearance? Yeah, it was interesting. I feel like just because they were picking so late in the draft, no one really knew what to expect, really, with how the first round was going to unfold and the way that it did unfold. I think a lot of people would would have agreed that Dax Hill, their first round pick, was definitely, if not if not the best player available on the board, one of the highest graded players on the board and, and fits a short-term need for just general depth in the secondary and a potential long-term need at safety and just the rest of the class with how defensive loaded it was. It was also a bit surprising because you may have expected maybe one more pick at wide receiver or tight end, but they traded up twice um, to, to pick a uh, cornerback and Cam Taylor Britt and another safety in Tyson Anderson. And that's, that never really happens with the Bengals. Trading up once is already a rare enough thing. <laughs> Trading up twice is definitely unforeseen when you're talking about the Bengals. So only six picks and five on defense was a bit surprising. I think a lot of people weren't too familiar with some of the names that they that, that they picked. But the more that we learned about them, the more um, I think the more people were on board with it. Well, let's. Uh, yeah, because you said five out of the six draft picks were def- were on defense. And um, there were some, uh, there were some good. I, I like some of the picks. I thought in all between even the picks, and we're going to get into some of the rookie signings, the, the free agent signings. I thought they did well. There were a couple of things that were off the board when it came to the way our lads felt that the players should have been drafted. What round? Um, there was one player that I I just don't like, but. Uh, Overall, I thought the, I thought the team did well. Let's start first of all uh, with those DBs because I don't know. I mean, this just smacks. Uh, sorry, Jesse, but uh, you won't be coming back. Uh, when they not only did they draft Jackson Hill, but they go like you said, they trade up to get Cam Taylor Britt who has safety experience, and then they tab another safety in Tyson Ant. So come on, I mean if this doesn't signal that we're going to play hardball and we probably aren't going to meet your demands and I don't know, but let's start with that. Is that what that was that the Bengals really don't have um, confidence that Jesse Bates is going to be here long-term? Yeah, I think their confidence was all but like erased when they couldn't get a deal done before the franchise tag window expired in early March. So that was already in the back of their minds. But I think, I think they genuinely believed that Dax Hill was like, clearing away the best player available to them in the first round and you just come off a Super Bowl team your team is mostly intact you might as well just pick the guy that's staring at you in the face and it just so happens that he probably projects to be a nice free safety in their defense and with Tyson Anderson I think they had him graded as a third round pick which is why they were so aggressive to get him in the fifth they didn't really need another safety because in general like they have enough to get through the next couple of years but I think he's got an incredible special teams experience and the potential to be maybe a long term starter at, at the other safety spot along with him so they, they definitely just took advantage of just two guys that they graded highly at that spot. And it just so happens that Jesse Bates is going to be a free agent next year. He's probably not coming back. He might not even I mean, he'll probably play this year, but that's at least what he's threatening to not play this year. But also Von Bell is a, a free agent next year, too. And he's probably not coming back, too, because they don't really resign guys to the third contract. So they really took advantage of securing long-term death at the safety spot. And yeah, they, this is the Bengals. They will always play hardball with anyone who's not a quarterback for them. All right. Well, um, now let's get on. Uh, well, first of all, Daxon Hill, he's the easy one to talk about. So we don't have to spend a lot of time with him. Is he going to be used more? Do you believe as a safety or a nickelback? I think, I think anything really is on the table for him. Uh, one of the things that stood out to me when he was first brought in is that he, he not only knows that he's versatile but he embraces that and he wants to continue just being a positionless player and I think that's what he's going to be largely this year when they have solid starters at every single spot in the secondary now once Bates is out of the window like he's obviously the favorite to take that spot and you might see him more there but in general I think Lou and Arumo's defense it, it's kind of an amoeba it, it's an ever evolving thing in an organism really that just depends on what the other opposition, the other offense is doing. And that could involve Hill playing multiple spots, probably everywhere except outside cornerback, even though he said that he could eventually do that. I don't think that's where his skill set is probably maximized. I think naturally you will see him more at safety than any other spot, but overhang defender, nickel, 
um, maybe even sometimes linebacker. I think he can be in a lot, a lot of different places in this defense, and I think that's what they want. Do you think he'll be one of the top five defensive backs in snaps? Ah, uh, that's a great question because again, like the, the starters are all there. Yeah. They, they were really healthy last year at those spots too. And I don't think that's, that's true. probably sustainable. Yeah. So I, I'm going to say no right now, yeah. but it definitely wouldn't shock me. And Hilton is still the clear number one nickelback. Yeah. He's under contract for, I think three more years. They really like him. Yeah. He's not going anywhere. All right. Now Cam Taylor Britt. Uh, so I really like this kid. And even though our lads, graded him as a fifth rounder. I actually liked him and I thought he had more talent uh, to be higher than a fifth round grade. Because when you take a look at a guy that has the combination of the physicality, the good enough size and very fast that I just think, and versatility, I just think that that warrants pretty much where the Bengals made the pick. I could have seen him as a third rounder, but um, obviously the Bengals felt that, he was potentially going to be off the board, so they went up and grabbed him. Yeah, and I think it was definitely the case where it was either him or they were just going to punt on the cornerback position entirely, and I don't think that was ever in their plans. I think they wanted to take a cornerback in round one, and guys like Kyrie Elam went off the board before them, so they kind of acted, and they knew that they needed someone to compete with Eli Apple, and I think Taylor Britt definitely fits the mold of someone who can contribute early. I, I can kind of see why some people didn't really see him as a second round pick, maybe in that third to fourth round range. I, I think he didn't really benefit from kind of switching positions in the middle of his career. And there, there was some of a transition there, but along with Dax Hill, like Taylor Bird was incredibly productive at Nebraska too. And, you know, tested really fast and flexible for his size yeah. fits all of the physical you know requirements that, that they look for in their cornerbacks. So he might not be ready to play this year. And even if that's the case, like I think they have confidence that Eli Apple can be serviceable again, but going forward long-term, I think he can be really solid piece. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because they also, if you look at uh, Anderson, all three guys can play corner, nickel safety. So it, it shouldn't really be a surprise. Is Anderson the one guy though, that they also will feel that, will be an instant impact on special teams? A hundred percent. I think that was one of the main things that they liked about him, along with all of his character and just his leadership abilities. Like there's not a bad thing that's been said about this dude in his time in Toledo. I think he grew up there too. So he's a hometown yeah, guy. Nice, yeah. Like, like everything that, that makes him a person is what they value. And the fact that he was like, he was a special team savant, but he was also a leader on that defense. He did both. And I think that's, I think that's definitely appreciative in, in, in their eyes. So they saw him in the fifth round, even though they were pretty good at safety. Like, we, we just got to get this guy in the building. All right. Now, uh, we'll go next to the one player who was drafted right around where people thought he would be drafted. Maybe fourth round. Could have been third round. But a player that I'm not very high on. Uh, I, there's something about Zach Carter. I watched him play at Florida. I don't know whether or not it, 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 he's one of these guys that just appears to turn it on and turn it off at times, but maybe it's because he, maybe it's because he was expected to be more of a, 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 um, a pass rusher and really turned out to be more of a run defender first. And, and maybe that was it, but there was always, always something that bothered me because I always thought he had a tremendous talent. And I see these other, and, and I'm the type of guy that does believe when you, when, when one college continues to have like disappointing players at certain positions, you go, well, something's wrong there. What, what is it? Is it coaching? Is it the style? What is it? Why are these guys just never fits in the NFL? And this is where Carter's coming from. There's some guys that have been in the same position that Carter over the last few years in the same draft position is polite to one of them. And they just, they don't, they don't accomplish much in the NFL. So I just have a lot of issues with Carter, especially as a third round draft pick. But I would, you tell me, what is he there for? Is he there because, and I, and I noticed that Jeffrey Gunter was also uh, chosen in the seventh round. Both guys are big physical players. But like I said, is Carter there more likely to be um, more of a run defender, versatile backup? 
Yeah, I think I can definitely understand like the hesitancy with Carter. Like I didn't know much about him when they drafted him, and like, I saw like Dame Brugler had like a sixth round grade on him or something like that. And yeah, the production didn't really stand out until maybe like the end of his career. But I think what kind of held him back, like he was a four star recruit, you know, grew up a Gators fan and everything. At six four two eighty two, he wasn't that great of an athlete. And at that size, when you don't have a lot of burst off the edge, like projecting you know, him going forward against even tougher competition is a little bit interesting, which is why I think the plan for him is just to play inside and maybe bulk up a little bit more. He's already pretty long with 33 and a half inch arms, okay. but at 6'4", 282, I think the Bengals coaches mentioned that like 282 was just the weight that he was at the combine. He was probably a little bit uh, heavier or like, a little bit more bulk on him during the season. So I think they envisioned him around like 290 to maybe almost 300 pounds to be more of a three technique or a five technique. They really need like depth at both of those spots because they don't have a natural three technique on the roster aside from BJ Hill. So I think him playing in the B gap or over the tackle instead of being on the edge where again, he, like you said, he wasn't really that effective uh, against, you know, you know, quality tackles in the sec. I think playing him more inside of those two positions might benefit him going forward, but definitely more of, of a, just like a backup run defender yeah. at this point. No, that makes sense. Okay. And then uh, might as well just, uh, um, well, actually, you know what? I want to do this first. Let's talk about uh, Cordell Volson because here's another guy that our lads believed was a seventh round grade. Um, but you're talking about a dominant FCS offensive lineman, versatile, can play tackle, can play guard, supposedly has an NFL ready frame, um, you know, uh, never, supposedly never allowed a sack uh, in college, which is incredible. And when you have the combination of smarts and desire and all that kind of stuff, uh, well, why not? Why not take a guy and also feel pretty fortunate that you were able to pick him up? Uh, but fourth round, was that a little bit too high or was it because they really like something about him and believe that he could be a future starter? Yeah, at this point, like in the, in the late fourth round, it's basically a fifth round pick. Like, I, I don't really get too involved in like the, the whole value discussion at this point because like he could be there in the fifth and sixth and you can say things about it and, and whatever like I feel like at this point it, it's it's more or less marginal and with Volson obviously like the, the knock on him is that he's old and he played you know at an FCS school but if you're going to play at an FCS school you might as well play at the one where they, they teach you pro style concepts and he come in, he comes into the NFL knowing a lot of the blocking schemes that, that he will you know have to learn with the Bengals. So the only issue is how does that strength and power match up against actual NFL players, against actual players that are going to play football long term. He didn't really see that much against uh, uh, when he was playing at North Dakota State. So that transition is going to be interesting to watch. But I think just the fact that he can, he comes in with NFL ready size and strength. And, you know, again, he's 24 years old this year. I, I think all of that combined with, again, his character, his love for the game, uh, everything that Jackson Carmen probably didn't bring them last year in terms of commitment and, and coachability, I think that definitely stood out to them as a guy that, hey, he can come in immediately and really grab a potential starting job by, by the horns, like unlike the guy that they took last year. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, it's a good point because that's what I say all the time. And I, if you like, if you do like a, a, a show on Friday after the first round and you, let's say you even do a show uh, after day two or well, day one, day two. And now you're maybe, Hey, did they reach a little bit there? And you know, what's the deal there for me? I think that analysis can be completely different when the draft is over. Cause once the draft is over, I don't really care where they were drafted. I just take a look at all the players they acquired, including the guys they signed. And that's why, even though I think there were a lot of question marks with players that might've been drafted earlier, the fact is, is that they acquired some good talent and that's the most important facet of what you're trying to do here we round out with jeffrey gunter and i wanted to actually round out with him because not only did they draft him in round seven but they also signed a couple of his teammates mm -hmm. uh a wide receiver and a running back so they, they like something about these coastal carolina kids apparently the chanticleers <laughs> like like they really popped off i guess two years ago yeah. when you know, they were like top 15 but gunter um, yeah, he's been productive there a couple of years. I think he like transferred to Syracuse and then NC State and then back to Coastal Carolina. So he's been on somewhat of a journey, but 6'4", 260, phenomenal athlete, really productive and in, in getting into the backfield for a seventh round pick. I think that's everything that you could possibly hope for, like end of the seventh round yeah. as well. So I think they mentioned that when they traded up 
um, for I believe it was Taylor Britt. They gave up a six round pick and they would they said they would have considered Gunter 100 percent with that six round pick had they still had it. So this was, a, again, another value pick. They need um, answers at edge defender because they don't really have a ton of depth behind Hendrickson and Hubbard. Like they have Joseph Asai, but no one's really proven yeah. behind their two starters and they really need to establish a quality rotation. So Gunter's going to have definite opportunities this year. Uh, speaking, before we get into the signings, uh, was there a position or two that you felt that the Bengals did not, they just were not able to address? That they should Yeah, it's it's probably wide receiver or tight end. And again, like it's, it's not going to kill them if they don't draft a tight end or a wide receiver, but they don't have a ton of depth at those spots. And if one of their starting receivers go down, that changes the entire dynamic of what this offense is because the base is to have those three receivers out there for like 90, 95% of the time yeah. and they all bring different skill sets. So they, they brought in a ton of receivers after the draft and we can talk about yeah. that, but I think they, I think they did want to draft a receiver. It just, they ended up with only six picks. So I'm just taking a look at some of the guys that are available in free agency. Is that a possibility? Uh, or do you think based on what's out there, those aren't the type of guys that would interest them? Probably they wouldn't be interested. Like Will Fuller comes to mind just because I remember they really liked him. Uh, in the 2016 draft and they were considering drafting him and then the Texans took him. But if he's still out there and, and the Bengals haven't brought him in, I don't think they will. Yeah. He's never healthy. And then last year with some of those issues, like, yeah, I mean, why bother? Okay. Uh, now let's talk about some of those signings. We mentioned uh, the receiver from Carolina and I really like the receiver from Miami. When I was going over my, uh, when I was going over all of my research on, on, on the guys, even before our lads came out and, and Sorensen just obviously stuck out because how can he not, you know, first team Mac led the team in receiving for all four years, uh, even against a good team like Minnesota in, in, in a, as coming away from group of five to power five, he had six receptions for 97 yards and a touchdown. He was the Mac championship offensive player of the game in 2019. Uh, and, Look, he had over he had 191 career receptions, over 3,000 career yards, 20 touchdowns, and a 16 yard career average. And they just had to sign him. So I'm sorry, but this is the type of kid that's going to wind up finding a way on the roster. I would be very impressed to see that. Like I think you just look at him physically; he's like six foot, 190. He's not very fast for his size, but he just finds a way to just pluck the ball out of the air, and it's and it's impressive. Like you don't average 16.3 yards per catch by accident you're going downfield and, and snagging those balls and that's that's what he did consistently at miami like i like my best one of my best friends is uh, he lives in athens ohio so he, he went to ou and he, even he knew about him because he Sorensen dropped 283 yards on OU this past season. Like he was just phenomenally productive for just not being that great of an athlete. And maybe that might hinder him against NFL cornerbacks. But you get to training camp in preseason when these guys get their opportunities, he could absolutely find a spot, at least on the practice squad. He reminds me of the same thing that I said about Scott Miller when he came out. I was like, hey, here's Scott Miller, very productive at Bowling Green, a Mac. You know, he doesn't have the size, the speed, all that kind of stuff, or at least what you're looking for in the NFL. But, hey, all he's doing is catching big passes with Tom Brady, you know, their Super Bowl season. So, come on. I mean, these guys could stick. You know, especially <laughs> when you have a quarterback like Tom Brady and and uh, Joe Burrow. You know, it's going to make life a lot easier for these guys. Right. All right. What about the other kid from Coastal Carolina? Yeah, J Javion Hiley, uh, I believe is how you pronounce his name. Really productive out of there. And a little bit of probably a better athlete, more explosive um, I really like the way that he runs routes and just gets in and out of his breaks. I think they don't really have a true backup to Tyler Boyd in the slot. But I think if, if he if highly has to come in for like 10, 15 snaps, gain separation against some nickel cornerbacks, I think he can absolutely do that. You know, very experienced. And again, they really like something out of Coastal Carolina. So I think he's going to get a shot. OK, uh, then a couple of guys that had draftable grades for our lads were one on offense, the offensive lineman, Ben Brown. Who's, who's the grandson of Alan Brown, a two-time Super Bowl champ. Uh, he's oh, wow. versatile, can play center and guard. And the other guy was Carson Wells, uh, the linebacker from Colorado, a four-year starter, and uh, a guy that's uh, you know your typical high-motor defender, productive, will do his best big time to find his way on the, on the roster, including special teams. So what about those two players? I really like Carson Wells. I, I agree with you. I think he probably should have been drafted. I, I think it's interesting that the Bengals are listing him 
as a linebacker, not an edge defender, because he did get most of his production playing off the edge. But he did have plenty of experience dropping back into coverage. That's probably what he needs to continue doing if he wants to make the roster, just to be able to play in space and maybe blitz a little bit, because he definitely has experience with that. But incredible production, pretty solid athlete, too, out of Colorado. Very, very solid production profile for him. And Ben Brown, yeah, just being an offensive lineman with the Bengals, even with their starting lineup taken care of, you're always going to get opportunities to be a potential depth player. And yeah, you know, Brown had a lot of buzz uh, for, as well, but I think his injury kind of hurt him in the process. He wasn't able to test. I think he missed some games in his past year, but 6'5", 312 pounds, 34-inch arms, the ability to play center and guard, I, I think he definitely has a chance as well. Okay, and then uh, the, the, the other two, actually, there's one other player that really stood out to me uh, not a draftable grade from our lads, but again, just like a Jack Sorensen get, uh, kid that when I was doing my research, it's like, wow, this guy stuck out. And I also watched them play in big games for UTSA. They had obviously a mm. banner season. He was a big part of it on defense. He had big plays in their biggest game against UAB. So that's big. I mean, he's a leader. He can cover. Matter of fact, he led the team with 10 and a half sacks. He has 31 career tackles for loss. So yeah, you can understand because it is not a big guy. So you can understand why he wasn't drafted. But again, a very interesting guy to keep an eye on. Are you talking about Clarence, Clarence Hicks? Hicks? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, 6'2", 225, played a lot on the edge. But of course, that size, you're just going to be a linebacker. And yeah. that's like he's like him and Wells, I think special teams is going to be very important. Um, I think he played more. Well, Hicks played more special teams in 2021, along with being, you know, but this really productive player on defense. So just just the ability to play in space and to be explosive and to do more roles on special teams will give you will give him the opportunity to maybe make an impact on defense. So it's going to be interesting to see how those guys fill into those spots because they lost a, a handful of special teams players from last year and they're going to need to replace those snaps somehow. OK. And uh, were there any other players that I did not mention? And also last year if we were talking about the same types of players middle to late round draft picks rookies that were signed played mostly on the practice squad that may you may want to keep an eye on because you believe that they could take a big step this year as you pay attention to the training camp because we we won't talk again until at some point in training camp or the preseason so because of that can you give us a couple of players to keep an eye on yeah, so for this for this year, I think the other undrafted free agent to watch for is Kwame Lasseter the second, just because he has experience returning punts. And if they're going to keep a receiver from this undrafted class, I think it might be best to bet on the guy that can take Trent Taylor's spot at punt returner. Okay. So that experience will definitely help him out. The NFL bloodlines doesn't hurt either. And a guy from last year that could take a step is Deontay Smith, 100%, because he almost won the right guard job, starting job, last training camp before he got injured. Okay. He, had, he had never played guard before in college, and he just came in and really ascended and just played better than anyone else that they had. But unfortunately, he got injured last year, and now he's more at left tackle. But if neither Volson or Jackson Carmen really shows out at left guard during you know training camp, they might bring Smith back into that spot. And if he's improved and you know improved his body over the course of a year after getting healthy, it's not... It's not implausible to see him actually winning that battle. All right. Well, uh, and, and the offensive line, though, everybody knew that was the big issue after the big game. So are the fans pretty content with what the Bengals have done to improve that position? Oh, I think content is like an understatement. This is like one of the best offensive lines the Bengals have had in a long time. And, you know, it, it's not phenomenal by any means, but it, it's solid. And I think Bengals fans have been craving just solidity and stability at that position group. And they finally have it. Excellent. And uh, injuries before I let you go. Anybody that we need to keep an eye on who's rehabbing? Yeah, so T. Higgins and Logan Wilson are still rehabbing uh, torn labrum, in, labrum injuries. You have Joseph Asai. I think he had like a cleanup procedure for his torn meniscus that he suffered back in August. And Alex Kappa, one of the guards that they signed, I think he suffered like a core muscle injury during OTAs. But I think all of those guys should be back and fully healthy by training camp. And it's just up to getting through camp and preseason healthy. Yeah. And, and we talked about Osai uh, last time. He's he's he could be the big difference maker up front on defense if, if he comes back healthy and what he can do as far as helping the pass rush. So. He's going to be, probably be one of the big stories to watch in camp this season, correct? 100%. Like, I'm really interested to see, you know, how he looks coming off of that injury. It's just his ability to bend around the edge. And, like, they they really needed him 
last year they had Sam Hubbard playing like a thousand snaps and I think getting a more healthy and consistent rotation along with Trey Hendrickson doing his thing that would greatly benefit the defense all right John so uh you have a show how often do you do the show once a week yeah so me and my co-host Anthony Casenza we uh host the orange and black insider Bengals podcast for Cincy Jungle and we go live Every Wednesday night at 8.30 Eastern Central Time. You can check us out on YouTube and anywhere you can get your podcasts. And again, check everything out. Uh, Bengals related, cincyjungle.com. John, I appreciate it. I can't wait to talk to you again when the preseason hits because that means the NFL regular season is uh, close. And uh, yeah. it's gonna it goes by fast, and I can't wait for it to go by fast. Absolutely, Greg. Thanks, John. Talk to you then. Take care.